Hi, everyone. Great that you're all here again for an exciting session today. Today, we will start with Danny Holmes presenting on silicon-based quantum computing. And then we will have our collaborators from SEEK. Uh, John Levy will give a keynote on quantum scalability, entrepreneurship, energy, and um, climate. Very exciting. And then we will have a virtual lab tour by SEEK, where we will learn more about not only supercollecting quantum computing, but also about their foundry. It is my pleasure to introduce Danielle Holmes. Danielle Holmes is a researcher at UNSW, University of New South Wales in Australia, Sydney. And uh, she's a researcher in the group of Andrea Morello. She works on silicon-based quantum computing, where they implant single donors in silicon. And this is a method compatible uh, with industry standards in the semiconductor, uh, semiconductor industry. Danielle did her PhD at the University of Melbourne, and before that, she was at the University of Cambridge. And her own research focuses mostly on the nanofabrication of qubit devices and the deterministic placement of implanted donor qubits using single ion detectors. Danny, great to have you here. We are really excited uh, to see your lecture and to ask you questions and learn everything about silicon-based quantum computing. Can you share a bit um, why do you work in quantum technology and why do you like working in quantum technology? Thank you very much for that introduction, Marlu. You said it better than I could have said myself. So as to why I really love working in quantum technology, I find it really fascinating that you can study the quantum aspects of the universe just by engineering single atom devices in our laboratory. So when I was younger, I used to be really fascinated with astrophysics and wanting to learn all about the universe and really keen to be an astronaut, but then eventually realized that I couldn't actually go out there and actually test the stars that I was interested in. But then if you can come into a laboratory and engineer single electron systems, you can kind of magnify down and shrink into understanding the like underlying laws of nature in these systems, which I think is super fascinating. And just seeing how the space of quantum computing is exploding at the moment is a great time to be in the field. That is great to hear. And we actually have participants who are now expanding from astrophysics into quantum computing. So great to hear about your interest there. Please share your slides. Take it away. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And it's my absolute pleasure to be here at the Quantum Momentum Programme. You've got an excellent array of talks on offer for everyone to watch. So as you already mentioned, my name is Danielle Holmes, and I'm a postdoc studying at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, focusing on implanted donor spin qubits in silicon in the group of Professor Andrea Morello. And today I'll be sharing about how we can actually build silicon-based quantum computers. And thanks so much for joining and tuning in today. So let's get started. So before diving into how to build a quantum computer using silicon, I think it's really important to appreciate that all of our current computers are built from this same material. So silicon is a semiconductor, which makes it ideal for building transistors that are the building blocks of all of our computers that we use today. So because it's a semiconductor, under normal conditions, silicon is electrically insulating, so it doesn't conduct electricity. However, we can make metallic source and drain electrodes shown in this image here in pink by doping the silicon by implanting it with impurities. We can also apply a gate voltage on top of this device, which will cause a flow of electrons between the silicon channel. And this switches the transistor from the off state to the on state by causing a current to flow by applying a voltage. So it turns into an electrically conducting state. Silicon also has the ability to grow a high quality oxide just by heating it up in oxygen. And this allows us to have gates that are electrically insulated from these doped source and drain electrodes. Another great thing about silicon is that it's highly abundant. And that means it's readily available and very cheap to use to make our computers. It's actually the second most abundant element in the Earth's crust after oxygen, which is a fun fact that I learned the other day. So all in all, silicon has been really fundamental to the development of modern day electronics. And these advances in silicon engineering 
have allowed transistors to shrink down exponentially for the last 50 years, as shown in Moore's law. And we've been able to shrink transistors all the way down to the nanometer scale, which enables us to fit billions of these transistors onto a single silicon chip, as shown in this impressive image on the right. And this delivers impressive computational power. And the development of manufacturing on this scale has pushed the cost of a transistor down to thousands of times cheaper than a single grain of rice, which I find fascinating. So as impressive as this is, however, sadly Moore's law can't continue indefinitely because it's actually already slowing down. And this is because as we shrink transistors down to the nanometer scale, we encounter quantum effects, such as electrons tunneling between very closely spaced gates. And this makes it impossible to have our transistors in a completely off state and it introduces errors into our computation. So if we want to continue to increase computational power, we can't just simply keep shrinking down our classical transistors or bits. And we have to look beyond our classical transistors into a different type of physics. So enter quantum. So in our regular computers, we store and process information in classical bits, which either exist in the zero or the one state defined by the off and on states of the silicon transistor that we encountered previously. Quantum computers, however, store and process information as qubits or quantum bits. And these are made from quantum systems that have two energy levels defined as the zero and the one state. And these qubits can exist in a superposition of both zero and one at the same time. So whereas n classical bits contain only n bits of information, if you can entangle n qubits together, such that each of their states is dependent on all of the other states of the qubits, they will contain two to the power of n bits of information. And this number is exponentially larger than just the number n by itself. And this exponential relationship is what gives quantum computers their power. So when we add extra classical bits to our classical computers, it simply increases the power linearly. Whereas each time you add an additional qubit, it doubles the power of a quantum computer. So because all we need to make a qubit is a quantum system with two energy levels, we can actually just use the spin of an electron in a magnetic field. And this is actually known as a textbook qubit because the spin one half of an electron exists in the spin up or spin down states, which is your zero or one of your qubit system. And we can use all of the benefits of silicon to create this type of qubit simply by shrinking down our transistors that we find in classical computers down to just having a single electron in this transistor channel that we can control. So why choose silicon to make a quantum computer? Well, there's actually many benefits to doing this. And the obvious main one is the fact that all of our existing computers are made out of this material. So we have a, a vast pool of knowledge in this area already. So uh, most importantly, um, we can advance spin qubits using this scalable classical technology since humans have spent the last 50 years developing this industry to a point where we can routinely produce billions of identical transistors in an area just the size of a fingertip. And so if we can fabricate qubits using similar technologies and materials, then we may be able to speed up the progress of quantum computers by around 50 years. Another very important benefit of silicon is that the silicon qubits have a very small footprint or area on a chip. And this is around 100 by 100 nanometers. And these are especially suited to producing two-dimensional arrays of qubits, which allows us the possibility of fitting a compact fault-tolerant quantum computing processor containing millions of qubits on a single chip inside a conventional cryostat without needing additional infrastructure. Silicon also has the additional benefit of possessing zero spin isotopes, such as silicon 28, which doesn't have a zero spin. So it makes a very nice noise-free environment for our qubit to live in, which is actually unlike the three, five semiconductors, such as gallium arsenide. So we really like silicon because it can produce 
really long-lived quantum states with this low noise environment and its weak spin orbit coupling also contributes to this increased coherence time. And these factors actually make silicon one of the most coherent solid state systems found in nature. So thanks to this long coherence time and the advances in fast spin readout techniques, we can achieve single and two qubit logic gates with fidelities above 99%. And this is such a low error rate that it should be possible in future to incorporate error correcting algorithms into our quantum computers to have fault tolerant computing. So typically silicon qubits are cooled down to tens of millikelvin to achieve optimum performance. So that's just tens of a thousandth or a hundredth of a degree above absolute zero, which is very cold. However, these qubits show greater promise because they may actually be able to operate at higher temperatures above one Kelvin or one degree above absolute zero. And at this raised temperature, the cooling power of our cryostats that we use to cool down our qubits is many orders of magnitude higher, allowing it to cope better with the heat load associated with the control of millions of qubits. So all in all, silicon is a very promising system to build our qubits in. However, along with all other quantum computing platforms, there are still many challenges that we face in scaling up to larger numbers of qubits. And the first one is the fact that materials development is an area of critical importance. So for example, in order to reliably produce qubits with a low noise and a low variability, we need to have isotopically enriched silicon 28 transistor channels that produces this low noise environment for our qubit to live in that I mentioned before. And we also need to have high quality interfaces that don't have charge traps or a large fixed oxide charge to be able to have uniform qubits across our chip. And in future, we will need millions of qubits on our chip to implement error correction algorithms. And in order to achieve these really large numbers of qubits, we're going to have to develop very clever architecture designs that will be required to create dense two-dimensional arrays of donor qubits, uh, sorry, uh, spin qubits in silicon. Um, and we need to be able to have individually addressable qubits with interspersed control and readout electronics and high connectivity between our qubits to implement entanglement, for example. However, I personally think that the main challenge in scaling up silicon qubits is going to be tackling their reproducibility. So to date, most advances that have been made in silicon spin qubits have been made in academic clean rooms in universities and have fabricated just a small number of qubits. However, these academic clean rooms uh, offer only modest levels of process control and reproducibility. So in order to produce large scale arrays of high fidelity qubits for fault tolerant architectures, we're going to need an industrial scale clean room, a bit like shown in this image here on the right, which would be capable of producing high levels of reproducibility that you find in the microelectronics industry today. So now that I've motivated the reason why we're interested in silicon spin qubits and some of the challenges, that we have to encounter. Um, now I'm going to tell you how to build these qubits. And there are three main types of silicon spin qubits that I'm going to cover today. So the first type is quantum dots, which are made by confining electrons in silicon using surface nanoelectronics. And these quantum dots come in two main types. So the first one is the silicon MOS or metal oxide semiconductor quantum dots. And in these silicon MOS qubits, electrons live in the silicon layer near the oxide interface. And these are electrically insulated from metallic gates by the oxide layer. And then in the second type of quantum dot architecture, we have the silicon silicon germanium heterostructure where the electrons live in a silicon well that's sandwiched between layers of silicon and germanium and insulated from metallic gates above by an oxide layer. 
And then the third type of spin qubit it's in silicon that I'll talk about today is the donors in silicon, which is my personal area of research. So I think it's my favorite one at the moment. And we can make these qubits uh, by replacing a single silicon atom with a donor qubit. And it binds an additional electron by the Coulomb potential to the donor nucleus. And so these are actually two for one qubit systems as you've got both the spin of the electron and the spin of the donor nucleus that you can use as qubits. So I just wanna talk a bit about the silicon quantum computing ecosystem that we have. And there are many different groups around the world that are working on fabricating these different types of spin qubits in silicon that I mentioned. And academia has played a really key role so far in demonstrating the potential of these qubits on the small scale. So first of all, for the silicon, silicon germanium quantum dots, we have the University of Pennsylvania, Princeton University, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Ricken, Aachen University, and TU Delft all working on this type of quantum dot. And then for the silicon MOS or metal oxide semiconductor quantum dots, we also have TU Delft and then UCLA and UNSW Sydney. And then finally working on the donors in silicon, we also have University of New South Wales, UNSW Sydney. So many industry groups are also now joining into this quantum computing ecosystem as they've seen the progress that academic clean rooms have made so far and they want to get involved with the space race for developing quantum computers. And so many groups are interested in adopting silicon as a platform since it shows such great promise and they're working towards scaling up to having larger numbers of qubits to producing fault tolerant quantum computers. So firstly, working on the silicon, silicon germanium quantum dots, we have HRL laboratories, Intel and Sandia National Labs. And then we have many different companies working on the silicon MOS quantum dots. So we've got Intel, Quantum Motion, Dirac, Quantum Silicon Grenoble, Quobly, IBM, and also Sandia National Labs. And then finally, working on donors in silicon, we have the Silicon Quantum Computing Company and Sandia National Laboratories. So just wanted to make clear that this list is not completely exhaustive and that the silicon quantum computing ecosystem is rapidly growing. So we'll see this space evolving in the near term. So now let's talk about what is the current state of the art for silicon spin qubits and what records have we achieved so far with this platform. And to date, most of these results have been pushed forward by the academic groups at universities. So for the first record, this is the number of qubits that have been demonstrated to be fully operational in a quantum processor. And at the moment, this number is six in a linear array of silicon, silicon germanium quantum dots as shown in this image here. And this number is rather small compared to on the order of hundreds of qubits that have been achieved, for example, in superconducting platforms, photons and ion traps. However, we expect to see large gains in this space for silicon quantum computing with the help of incoming industry collaborations. So a second important metric is the coherence time of these uh, silicon spin qubits. And silicon 28 is a very impressive host when it comes to storing quantum information. And we've seen record coherence times for the electron and nuclear spins in a phosphorus donor spin qubit of around half a second for the electron and over 30 seconds for the nucleus which is the record spin coherence time in single qubits in the solid state. Next, another important metric is how fast can you actually drive these qubits? So what's the single qubit operation time for applying a gate? And the record currently stands at only 42 nanoseconds, which is measured for silicon metal oxide semiconductor nanowire quantum dots. Then we have the single qubit gate fidelity, uh, which is a percentage that basically tells you how error-free you can perform these gate operations. And we also have the record being held by the silicon, silicon germanium quantum dots shown in the top right there. 
And this record has a fidelity of 99.96 for a single qubit gate fidelities, which is very high. Then we've got our two qubit gate operation time, which has been pushed down to 40 nanoseconds in silicon, silicon germanium quantum dots in this device shown here. And in the same device, we've been able to demonstrate two qubit gate fidelities of 99.81%. So all in all, silicon spin qubits show great promise because the operation time of the gates is very fast compared to their long coherence times. And this results in very high fidelity operations that can be performed. And we're looking forward to scaling up in future to a large number of qubits. So now let's talk about how to build our silicon spin qubits. And I'll first go through the process of building up both the silicon MOS uh, quantum dots and the silicon silicon germanium quantum dots from the bottom up. So starting from your handle wafer, uh, first we would deposit a isotopically enriched silicon 28 layer or the silicon germanium heterostructure onto the wafer using something called chemical vapor deposition to build up your layers. We would then create the electrically insulating oxide layer, either by simply heating up the silicon in oxygen to grow a thermal oxide, or by something called atomic layer deposition, where you can deposit a dielectric material to insulate it. And then finally, we finish off by building a multi-layer gate stack by using multiple layers of patterning using electron beam lithography and metal deposition. And we need to use electron beam lithography to achieve these really fine features on the order of um, tens of nanometers. And the wavelength of light is simply not small enough to be able to pattern these features, which is why we need to switch to using the higher energy electron beams to pattern such small structures. And then after we do our metal deposition of each layer, each layer will be insulated from other layers in the gate stack simply by having a native oxide that grows when aluminium is exposed to air, or you can deposit a dielectric material in between layers using atomic layer deposition. And then finally, we can confine our electron spin qubit into these quantum dot devices by tuning the electrical potential of the surface gates. So if you apply a more positive voltage onto the surface gates, you'll attract an electron underneath this gate structure. And we can confine it by pinching off the barriers by having a slightly more negative voltage on the barriers to repel locally the electrons and just create a small pool of electrons and tune that down to the single electron layer level. So now let's talk about how we can fabricate donors in silicon, which is the platform that I research in. So for donors in silicon, we don't require any surface nanoelectronics to confine our electron spins like we do for the quantum dots previously. So instead, when you replace a single silicon atom, which is found in group four of the periodic table, with any of the group five donor atoms, it binds an extra electron with the Coulomb potential of its nucleus because the donor nucleus has an extra positive charge relative to the silicon surrounding it. So we don't need any extra gates to confine our electron. It just naturally sits at the donor nucleus. And another benefit for this system is that it's a two for one qubit system as you've got both the spin of the nucleus and the electron. And in the case of the simplest donor, we've got phosphorus, which has a spin one half, so that you've also got a spin up and a spin down for the phosphorus donor. So you've got your zero and one for your qubits in both the electron and the donor nucleus. And there's a couple of different ways that we can fabricate these donor spins. And I'll just go through them briefly now. So the first method is using a scanning tunneling microscope tip to pattern your silicon surface using a hydrogen resist. And you locally remove some hydrogen atoms from this surface. And then you incorporate a phosphine gas that will locally incorporate the phosphorus donors at exactly the sites that you want them to be defined by the STM. So in this way, you can incorporate the phosphorus donors into your silicon and then grow over with more silicon to encapsulate those phosphorus donors and then control them and read them out for your qubit system. And this is the work uh, being done by Michelle Simmons at the University of New South Wales. 
And then another method is to use ion implantation to introduce your donor atoms in silicon. And this has a very nice advantage of being able to mass select from any of the group five donors. So instead of just being able to incorporate phosphorus into silicon, you could implant higher spin nuclei such as arsenic, antimony, and bismuth, and study more exotic physics with this. And so this is a really nice uh, scalable pathway using ion implantation, as it's also compatible with semiconductor industry methods of fabrication. And so since this is my area of research, um, I will go through a worked example of how we can fabricate these donor spin qubits in silicon using ion implantation, and then how we can measure them and control them and read out the spins and how we can entangle them together and looking at how we can scale up these implanted donor spins in silicon to having large numbers of qubits. And so even though this is a worked example, a lot of the key results should apply in general to most uh, spin qubits in silicon. So let's get started. So first of all, we have to fabricate our qubit. And here is a silicon wafer. And this is actually me in the clean room at UNSW in Sydney. It's a very nice shiny silicon wafer. Um, and it's just fresh and ready to begin fabrication where you would first of all grow your oxide on the surface, and then you implant a single donor atom into the silicon. And this is just done by firing a single atom using an ion implanter. Then after this, we have to fabricate our nanoscale electronics on the surface by patterning the aluminum gates using the electron beam lithography method that I mentioned earlier. And these will enable us to be able to control and read out our spin qubits in future. So once you've fabricated your qubit device, you then have to package it up and connect it with the outside world so that we can apply electrical signals to the gates to be able to control and read out the spin of your qubit. So shown here is a nice image of our tiny little sample in the middle there of silicon, which is being wire bonded to a printed circuit board uh, with a wire bonding tool. And then we can apply electrical signals to this printed circuit board. So we then get our enclosure containing this printed circuit board with our quantum device inside, and we mount it onto a dilution refrigerator that can cool our device down to around 10 millikelvin, or a hundredth of a degree above absolute zero, which is um, about 300 times colder than out of space. So it's very cold, and at these temperatures, our donor electron will be bound to our donor nucleus. And shown here is an image of one of our dilution refrigerators in Sydney in the group of Professor Andrea Murillo. And there I am next to it to just demonstrate the scale of the fridge. So after we've mounted our device and cooled it down in the fridge, we then apply an external magnetic field using a large solenoid magnet around our fridge. And this Zeeman splits the spin of the electron and nuclear spins into being spin up and spin down. And this results in the following spin Hamiltonian shown here, where in blue, we have the electron Zeeman interaction. In red, we've got the nuclear Zeeman interaction. And in pink, we've got the hyperfine interaction that describes the interaction coupling the electron and nuclear spins together. So now we have our system and we know it's Hamiltonian. How do we control our spins in the system? Well, we do this using a microwave antenna highlighted here in green. And this applies an oscillating magnetic field that's capable of spinning our spins around. So first of all, we need to make sure that our donor electron is trapped onto the donor nuclear site by raising the Fermi level of the single electron transistor island above both the spin up and spin down energy levels of our donor qubit. And so basically the electron remains trapped on the donor and it doesn't tunnel off onto the single electron transistor during this part of the experiment. And then we use our microwave antenna to apply an oscillating signal and we obtain two electron spin resonance peaks corresponding to the nuclear spin of the donor being either spin down or a spin up. 
And this flips the spin of the electron in both cases, because the frequency of the microwaves that we apply matches the energy splitting between our electron in the spin down and spin up states. So we can also do the same controlling experiment on our nuclear spins using the same on-chip microwave antenna. We just have to apply different frequencies. So these frequencies are much lower than our electron spin resonances, and we obtain two nuclear magnetic resonance peaks corresponding to the electron either being a spin down or a spin up. So this is how we can flip our spins of the nucleus and the electron. So now that we can control our spins, the last piece of the puzzle is to be able to read out the state of the qubit to determine if it's a zero or a one, to be able to retrieve the answer at the end of a quantum algorithm, for example. And we read out the electron spin by coupling it to something called a single electron transistor that's defined with surface gates on our quantum device. And this single electron transistor, or SET, acts as a very sensitive charge detector. And so to operate this system in readout, we first tune the Fermi level of this SET island to lie in between the spin up and spin down states of our donor electron. And so that if the electron is a spin up, it will have a high enough energy to tunnel off the donor and onto the single electron transistor island. And this causes the donor to become ionized and have a relative positive charge as it's lost an electron. And because this single electron transistor is a very sensitive detector for the local charge environment, it will have a current flowing through the SET when the donut is ionized. And then when the electron tunnels back onto it, the current goes away again. So we observe something called a current blip when we have our electron being a spin up and causing the donor to become ionized. However, if the electron is a spin down, its energy isn't high enough to be able to tunnel onto our single electron transistor. And so the single electron transistor won't have a current flowing through it. And the current will just be in the low state. And so we know that the electron is a spin down. So we can effectively determine whether the electron is a spin up or down or a, a zero or one in the qubit states, depending on whether or not a current is flowing through our single electron transistor. So now that we're able to control and read out our information, we need to be able to know that we can store our quantum information for long enough such that you'd actually be able to do useful um, control experiments onto the spin before it decoheres and the information is lost into the environment. So in order for this to be the case, we need to switch to using isotopically purified silicon, because if you just harvested natural silicon, um, it comes in the following isotopic abundance shown here, where you've got three isotopes in the relative fractions. And silicon 28 and silicon 30 are both our friends because they don't contain a nuclear spin. Whereas the silicon 29 nucleus, which occurs in abundance of around 5% in natural silicon, has a nuclear spin of one half. And this means it has a magnetic moment. And the presence of these silicon 29 spins in the environment of our donor spin qubit will introduce magnetic noise into our system by spin flipping. And this decoheres the qubit and causes quantum information to be lost into the environment. So we need to be able to move to isotopically purified silicon 28 that has a zero spin. And this creates an ideal low noise environment for our qubit to live in. And it sometimes gets called a semiconductor vacuum because it's effectively like having the qubit isolated in free space, but we have it in solid state instead, which makes it more useful to work with. So for our devices, we use an epi layer of deposited silicon 28 onto a natural silicon handle wafer. And inside this silicon 28 layer, that's where our donor qubits will live to have these low noise properties. And with this device, with the silicon 28 epi layer, we've been able to drastically increase our coherence times. So shown here in the table, you've got a comparison between 
the coherence times of your phosphorus donor electron and phosphorus donor nucleus for the natural silicon case, which is pretty short. And then you switch to silicon 28 and we achieve much, much longer coherence times and all the way up to over 30 seconds for our nuclear spin in silicon 28, which is like a lifetime on the order of donor qubit operations. So we can be sure that we will have high fidelity gate operations because we're not getting decoherence errors being introduced before we can actually perform our gate operations. So with this platform in silicon, we've been able to thoroughly explore and optimize our single donor qubit. However, in order to be able to implement a quantum algorithm, we also need two qubit gate operations. And for that, we need to find ways to couple two donor qubits together. And for this, there are many different ways that we can couple our donor qubits over, depending on the length scale that we're looking at. So if we first start from the smallest length scale, so below 10 nanometers spacing between our donors, we can couple our donors using uh, the el single electron sharing between two donor nuclei. And then if the donors are spaced slightly further apart, so on the order of 10 to 20 nanometers or so, each donor will have their own electron that can be coupled to each other through the electron exchange interaction. And then looking to longer length scales, we can also create a so-called flip-flop qubit from the combined state of a nuclear spin and an electron spin, and use the electric dipole interaction between these flip-flop qubits that allow us to space out our donors to 100 nanometers and more apart. And then finally, in the future, there's even the possibility of being able to shuttle electrons from one donor to another donor using intermediate quantum dots. And this would enable us to be able to shuttle uh, donor electrons to over micron distances um, using these quantum dots. And so it allows the possibility to be able to fit in more control and read out electronics in this system on your chip. And so I'm going to look more closely into the first three coupling mechanisms, starting from the smallest scale for our donor spin qubits. So firstly, I'll start with the wave function sharing, which is where you have two nuclear spins with a shared electron. So in this device, we had two implanted phosphorus nuclei that were spaced apart by six nanometers. So that's pretty small. And it's so close together that these donors share the same electron. So the electron wave function overlaps both of the nuclei. And the electron spin resonance spectrum of this single electron therefore will contain four different resonance frequencies, depending on the four different spin combinations of these two nuclei. So you've got nuclei down, down, nuclei down, up, nuclei up, down, and nuclei up, up. And these each have their own electron spin resonance frequency. And then if you look at the nuclear magnetic resonance spectrum, it shows two peaks that allows us to extract the individual hyperfine couplings between each nuclei and this shared electron. And in this device, we saw that the electron was more tightly bound to the donor nucleus on the left because we measured a much larger hyperfine coupling to the nucleus on the left than on the right. And so we can implement a two qubit control Z gate on this device between the two nuclei because they share this same hyperfine coupled electron. And to do this, we can look at this a uh, small video. So when we apply a two pi pulse onto the electron, so you perform a complete rotation of the electron spin around the block sphere at a particular electron spin resonance frequency, that will impart a pi geometric phase onto that particular nuclear state, which results in a minus sign. So for example, here, if we apply a two pi ESR pulse, on the state which has the nuclei in a spin down down, then we'll get this minus one factor for this spin down down state. And this matrix, unitary matrix shown here, is 
an example of a control Z gate. And so in this way, we can couple two nearby nuclei through this shared electron. And this work was demonstrated and published last year, which is very exciting for us. And we were also able to show that we could generate three qubit entanglement between the two nuclear spins and the single electron by making a maximally entangled so-called GHZ state. So next, we're going to look to larger length scales for coupling our donor spin qubits. Uh, and we'll be looking around the 10 to 20 nanometer regime where we have the exchange coupled electrons performing your uh, coupling between your donors. So in this particular device, we had two phosphorus donors that were implanted about 20 nanometers apart. And at this distance, each of the donor nuclei binds its own donor electron. And these two electrons are exchange coupled with each other. So we first magnetically detune these electrons using the hyperfine interaction by preparing the nuclear spins into opposite states. So either spin up, spin down, or spin down, spin up. And so if we just focus on the electron spin resonance transitions highlighted in the bottom row, then we have four different electron spin resonance frequencies for the target electron shown in brown that depends on the state of the nuclei and whether the control electron shown in blue is a spin up or a spin down. And in this device, we're in the weak exchange regime, which means that the exchange interaction is much weaker than the hyperfine couplings. And in this regime, we would implement a native C rock gate that can be obtained with just a single electron spin resonance pulse on resonance with one of these transitions. So for the two electron spin resonance transitions shown in blue here, this is an example of a C rock gate because it rotates the target electron in brown conditional on the control electron in blue being in the one state or the spin down state. Whereas these two electron spin resonance transitions highlighted in green here, they both implement something called a zero C rock gate as they rotate the target electron in brown, conditional on the control electron in blue being in the zero state or the spin up state. And this work was published on exchange coupled two electron uh, quantum gates last year, no, sorry, 2021. And this is a very nice result for us. So we'll finally now look at the larger length scales of around 100 nanometers plus using the potential of the flip-flop qubit and electric dipole coupling. So first of all, what is a flip-flop qubit? Well, it's created by the anti-parallel spin states of both the nucleus and the electron with the zero and one states shown in this energy diagram here. And we call it the flip-flop qubit because when we drive this transition, the electron and nuclear spin states will flip and flop in antiphase when we have this electric dipole spin resonance transition. And we can drive this transition by applying an alternating bias onto a gate above our donor that draws the electron wave function up and down. So it modulates the position of the electron with respect to this donor nucleus. And this changes the um, it changes the hyperfine coupling between the donor electron and the donor nucleus. And because this hyperfine coupling term is transverse in the spin Hamiltonian, if we can drive this electron dipole electric dipole spin resonance on resonance with this energy splitting in the diagram then we can flip and flop our nucleus and electron spins. And we've been able to demonstrate this coherent control of a single flip-flop qubit, where you can nicely see the spin up and spin down proportions of the electron and nuclear spin varying in antiphase, uh, using only electrical drive with that modulating gate above your donor qubit. And this result was published this year from our group. So with the flip-flop qubit, the nice thing is that we can use the fact that when the donor electron is ripped away from the nucleus, 
it creates an electric dipole due to the charge separation of the electron from the positive nucleus. And this allows flip-flop qubits to interact with each other using the dipole-dipole coupling, which is a long range interaction, which makes it insensitive to the exact placement position of our donor qubits, which makes it the perfect architecture for our ion implanted donor qubits, because with ion implantation, you will always get some uncertainty in the final resting position of your donor when it's implanted in the silicon. So this is a very nice uh, flip-flop qubit architecture that's suitable for our method of fabrication. And now that our group has demonstrated the operation of a single flip-flop qubit, our main goal is to be able to couple flip-flop qubits together with each other to have multiple flip-flop qubits in this architecture array shown here. So before I delve into scaling up outwards and creating these arrays of deterministically implanted donor qubits in silicon, let's look at another option for scaling up our system. So we can also scale up inwards by moving to higher spin nuclei. So, so far, I've only been talking about the phosphorus donor. However, there's the whole of the group five donors to explore in the periodic table. And when you go down the group five periodic table, the nuclear spin increases from the phosphorus of just being a boring spin half. You've got the spin up and spin down, which just makes a regular qubit system. But if you move to, for example, antimony one, two, three isotope, you actually have a nuclear spin of seven halves, which results in eight different nuclear energy levels instead of just the spin up, spin down for a nuclear spin of one half. And so because all of these energy levels are shifted by the quadrupole moment of the antimony nucleus, it means that they're individually addressable. So the frequency splittings are all slightly different. So we would be able to individually address these levels. And so we could look at operating a qdit instead of just a qubit where the D is like a higher dimensional system. And uh, this has nice implications for error correction, or you could use the system as multiple qubits. And another nice thing about these high spin donor nuclei is that they have something called a quadrupole moment, which allows us the exciting possibility of using all electrical control of the spin of the nucleus. Because when you apply an electric field to the system, it distorts the charge distribution around the nucleus and drives something called nuclear electric resonance, which would allow for smaller electrical antennas to be used for our devices instead of the current large on-chip microwave antennas that we use for magnetic drive at the moment. So, so far to date, all of the work that's been done in our group has been using timed implantation that basically sprinkles a random distribution of a small number of donor ions into our silicon quantum device. And then we tune up our quantum device to find the qubits that are nearby to our single electron transistor. And this has been very fruitful for exploring small numbers of donor qubits, but it's clearly not scalable for producing large numbers of arrays that we would need to build a useful quantum computer that could be error corrected for example, in this flip-flop qubit architecture shown before. So how can we make these arrays of qubits? So we're looking into scaling up outwards by pursuing something called deterministic single ion implantation. And with this method, we would collimate our donor ions through a movable atomic force microscope nano stencil that allows us to precisely place our donors in silicon. And then by implanting these single ions into a single ion detector, we can effectively count in an exact number of ions and create arrays of donors in a step and repeat fashion. So how do we realize these single ion detectors in our system? So we first have to fabricate a PIN diode on our silicon chip and apply a reverse bias to the electrodes at the top and the bottom of our silicon substrate. And this means that when you implant a donor ion into the detector's construction site that has a very thin gate oxide, then 
because we generate electron hole pairs into the silicon as the ion slows down, because we have this electric field gradient from the electrodes in the detector, these electrons and holes will be swept to opposite electrodes in the detector. And this will allow us to detect an ion beam induced charge signal for the implantation of a single ion. And this detected charge signal is proportional to the energy with which you implant the ion into the silicon. And it allows us to basically trigger the implantation event of our donor qubit. And so we would know that we've implanted one donor and it's time to go to the next implantation site to make an array, for example. So these single ion detectors have been fabricated and we've tested their operation in our group in a paper published last year. So in this work, we implanted 14 kilo electron volt energy phosphorus ions through a nano stencil atomic force microscope cantilever into the construction site of our single ion detector. And we measured the ion beam induced charge signal for each of the 10,000 detection events that we implanted into our detector. And we plotted these results into a histogram shown here. And because the energy of the generated electron hole pairs varies due to the, num the random nature of the donor ion stopping processes in the oxide and the silicon, you get this distribution of energy of created electron hole pairs. And by optimizing the noise threshold of the detector, we could achieve a single ion detection fidelity of up to 99.85% for our single phosphorus ions, which we're very excited about because this means we will be able to implant our donors with a very high confidence and know that we've achieved single ion implantation at each site that we want to implant our donors into that gives us promise for moving forward to making scalable arrays of donor qubits. So now that we know that we can deterministically implant our single donor ions in silicon, we need to be able to integrate them into qubit devices. And this is our current challenge that we're facing in our group, where we're developing a fabrication process flow to integrate the two to have a deterministically implanted donor qubit with a qubit device fabricated over it that's precisely aligned so that you can measure your qubit and control it once you've implanted it. And once you've achieved this mission, we can then begin to scale up to having larger numbers of qubits in arrays to implement algorithms. So as I come towards the end of my talk, it's time to look towards the future for hardware development in this field of spin qubits in silicon. And so to uh, give this prediction, I found a nice roadmap from one of the companies that I listed before called Dirac, that's actually based at UNSW, and it focuses on silicon metal oxide semiconductor quantum dots, and they give their best, a best estimate of the roadmap for how these qubits are going to scale in future. So we are currently in the academic era of this silicon platform which means that we're currently relying on university clean rooms to fabricate our qubits. And this era will allow us to produce on the order of up to 10 spin qubits in silicon. And this allows us to explore the fundamental physics of these spin qubits. Um, however, in the near term, it leaves us very far behind the other platforms such as superconductors, photons and trapped ions that have already achieved numbers much higher than this. However, as we enter the industrial era with the large scale companies, with the semiconductor foundry labs that have the ability to produce um, massive numbers of really reliable and consistent uh, transistors in our silicon computers that we have today, we can use the same technology to fabricate our quantum bits in silicon. And the really small footprints that these qubits have gives us hope that we'll be able to have not just millions, but even billions of spin qubits all fabricated onto the same silicon chip in the next few decades. And so 
We're hoping that in this industrial era, as large scale clean rooms uh, join the mission, that we'll be able to overtake the other platforms and be able to be competitive in this field, to be able to solve useful problems for quantum computation. So what kind of problems can we solve with these quantum computers? And so this comes to the future applications of this system. And we're first of all going to need many millions of qubits to be able to have error corrected quantum computers. But once we've achieved this, humans will have the ability to solve entirely different types of problems to what we can today that will have a huge significance on our world and the way that we operate. So since nature on the smallest scale is quantum, Quantum computers can simulate molecules and their interactions, allowing us to be able to understand and to design new medicines and materials, for example. Quantum computers will also have a very big impact on cryptography by changing the way that we keep online communications secure. And their ability to solve linear equations simultaneously very efficiently will aid machine learning and boost the potential for artificial intelligence. And their ability to process large amounts of data will increase the reliability of forecasting, such as weather forecasting, for example, which I'm sure we will all require going forward with unstable climate. And by being able to simulate interactions between atoms on the quantum level, they may reveal secrets to nuclear fusion, giving humans the ability to access an unlimited clean energy source. And with this, combined with their ability to simulate chemical reactions for capturing carbon and developing new materials and storage techniques for renewable energy, this should help us fight the biggest threat to humanity which we face today, which I see as climate change. And so I think all in all, it's a really exciting time to be in the silicon quantum computing field as we push towards scaling up to larger numbers of qubits and being able to realize this as a viable platform for quantum computing technology. And so in summary, I hope that I've convinced you that silicon is a really promising platform for building quantum computers due to their very small scales and the fact that we can leverage all of the knowledge that we have from classical computers. And so I've covered some of the advantages and challenges that we face with the silicon system. I've gone through the different types of silicon qubit with the dots, quantum dots and donors in silicon. I've covered the typical ecosystem of silicon quantum computing with groups coming from academia and industry working together to try and solve this mission for a full scale quantum computer. I went through the current status or state of the art of these silicon spin qubits by giving some records and how they compare to other systems. And then I've gone through how we can actually fabricate these quantum dots and donors and given quite a thorough worked example for the donor qubit system of iron implanted donors that we work with in our group and how we can fabricate these, how we can perform initialization, measurement, control um, of these qubits in the single qubit case, and also looking at two qubit gates with the different coupling mechanisms over the different length scales that I mentioned, and then how we can uh, tackle the scalability challenge by using this deterministic ion implantation. And then gone through the future hardware predictions and applications for using these quantum computers. So finally, I'd like to finish by giving a big shout out to the team at UNSW in Sydney, led by Professor Andrea Morello for making progress in this very exciting field. And we're always looking for really talented and passionate PhD students and postdocs. So feel free to reach out to any of us in our group uh, if you're interested. And finally, thank you to you all for tuning in and listening today. And I really welcome any questions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Danny, for this captivating and comprehensive talk. Really amazing. And I will share the questions with you that appear on Discord. Many questions you have also answered during the talk. So everyone, please share the questions again that haven't been answered yet or new questions that you have. 
the technique that you showed at the end using the deterministic implantation with the aperture in the in the AFM cantilever using a nanosensor, really amazing. Can you share more how this is different than the technique that is used using an STM, uh, blasting out hydrogens and implanting phosphor yes. there? And what do you think will have the future? Very good question. So I'll go through each of the techniques and how they differ and then uh, give some ideas on which method might be best. So for the first case, we've got the scanning tunneling microscope, um, which uses uh, the very small tip of this microscope to rip off the hydrogen atoms to be able to pattern this hydrogen lithography on the silicon surface. And then you incorporate the phosphine gas molecules and you get the phosphorus atoms sticking into the positions where the hydrogen was removed. And then you can incorporate these phosphorus atoms into the silicon by growing over with a silicon layer. Um, and this has a really nice benefit of being able to very precisely to within the order of the atomic lattice site position the donor qubits in silicon, which gives you really strong tunability of how the coupling between the two qubits goes. Um, however, on the downside, um, when you're removing the hydrogen, it's quite hard to remove a specific number of hydrogens. And so you might end up incorporating not just one, but a cluster of phosphorus donors. And so it's harder con to control the number of donor qubits, but it's easier to control the position of the donors when they get there. And then when we look at the other option, which is the work done by Professor Andre Morello and my team at UNSW in collaboration with the University of Melbourne, we've got the ion implantation method, where you basically just fire an atomic gun, you shoot your ion into your silicon, and it comes to rest. And so you don't have the atomic placement precision. In fact, it's more on the order of, say, like five nanometers or so that you can roughly uh, aim to get your atom to live. And this means we don't have very precise choice over our couplings if we go to the small length scales with, say, exchange coupled donors. But if we move to this clever flip-flop qubit architecture, it gives us more flexibility with where we're placing our donors because we're using this longer scale electric dipole coupling mechanism. And another nice bonus of the ion implantation method that I find really interesting is you can implant different species of donors. So not just the phosphorus, you can also have the higher spins with the antimony and gives you more exciting things to do with more energy levels and potentially makes it a more scalable system. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Uh, another question was asked earlier about having the really pure silicon 28 um, material and you deposited that layer. How is that purified crucible made? How can you be sure that there is no silicon 29, et cetera? That's a very good question. And the typical way that silicon 28 is produced is by using really large centrifuges that spin the silicon material. And because the isotopes have different masses, they'll be pushed uh, towards the edges of this kind of container at different rates and you can filter out the silicon 28. And this uses the same technology that they used when they were enriching uranium for nuclear um, fission reactors. So that actually comes from like an old relic technology that they now have taken on for silicon and enriched uh, silicon 28 to get, uh, they use a silane gas, which is silicon and hydrogen four molecule. So you've got these gas molecules flying around in this centrifuge and all spitting out at different rates. And they filter out this silane gas. And then with this silane gas, they use it as a precursor to get chemical vapor deposition to have deposited silicon 28 layers onto natural silicon. And we can use something called a secondary ion mass spectrometer to be able to actually tell us what are the impurities in this material. And we've been able to uh, typically get around 800 parts per million of silicon 29. So it's pretty pure silicon 28. And we're even looking to push this to lower levels of silicon 29 in future to get that pristine, clean environment for our qubits to live in with low noise. Very exciting. There are many more questions. I will pick a few. 
one question by uh, Durges from India is, can you please explain why the superconducting qubits will remain behind in the race compared to your technique? Good question. So superconducting qubits have had a really nice head start so far to date because they are quite large in comparison to the silicon qubits. So because of their larger sizes, it means they can be fabricated using easier methods, such as optical lithography instead of this electron beam lithography, um, which makes it more reproducible and more robust. So you can kind of fabricate these larger uh, superconducting qubits more easily in the near term. But then if we're looking to scale up to having on the order of millions or billions of qubits on a single chip, this larger size will actually come to haunt you in the end, I think, because you won't be able to fit as many onto one chip and you might end up having to have multiple cryostats with like multiple dilution refrigerators all connected together just to be able to contain like the vast number of superconducting qubits. And so, yeah, I potentially think that silicon qubits will be more scalable in the long run, being able to harness and leverage from the classical computer technology. Then a question uh, from David in the US. How would you use two different type of qubits? Can you imagine a future where you use different uh, implementations? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a good question. So there's quite a lot of interest in these so-called hybrid quantum systems where you kind of utilize the benefits of two different types of qubit. So for example, you might have the superconducting flux qubit that um, is nice and easy to fabricate. And uh, you can also operate it with fast uh, gate operations. And then you can couple this uh, superconducting flux qubit to, for example, a bismuth donor that we could implant in silicon nearby to the Josephson junction. And this would enable you to harness the long coherence times of the donor system and then kind of switch back and forth between these two qubits to like harness the best of both worlds. But there's a lot of research being done to integrate different types of qubits, like even donors coupled to quantum dots is quite easy to imagine where you could like shuttle the uh, electrons in between the quantum dots to mediate coupling between further spaced donor qubits. And then you've got the extra donor nuclear spin degree of freedom that you could use there as well so yeah interesting times <laughs> very exciting thank you very much is there a message that you would like to share with everyone who is starting their quantum journey now or some advice okay the message i would share is it's definitely a great time to be in this field so well done for considering the potential for jobs in this area because i really think it's the fastest growing field there's so much interesting physics that can be done in this area. And at the moment, it's super exciting. It's a bit like a space race. Nobody really knows which quantum computing platform is going to come out on top in the end. So there's lots of development being done in different areas. And so, yeah, the more brain power we have in this area is going to speed up the development. And then hopefully humans will be able to harness all of the fantastic properties of quantum computers in future to solve really interesting problems. Amazing. Thank you so much, Danny, for this really exciting session. It was really great having you.